professor in the, oops, sorry, I need to press this. Uh, I'm a professor in HDSI at UC San Diego. Um, I joined um, uh, UC San Diego last summer after spending, I think, a very long time, how long, 15 years um, at Ohio State University. Um, so I changed the title of the talk a bit to reflect the theme behind my uh, interest, which is uh, something called topological and geometric data analysis. And I reckon that this probably is less familiar to um, uh, many of you here, which I'm going to say a few words about that very soon. At any rate, um, uh, I graduated from Duke Uni University in uh, 2004, and I spent one year in Stanford as a postdoc. After that, I joined OSU, which I spent 15 really wonderful years over there, but still I'm very happy that I'm moving to the south, to the, to the, to the ocean, to the nice weather, and I'm really excited to, thanks for inviting me, really excited to actually to get to know this community. Um, I assume that many of you here are probably a more expert in AI, rather AI, you know, expert in the field than me. Um, what I want to tell you a little bit today is using the analysis of graph data, this example, to show that why, um, what is topological and geometric data analysis? Why geometric or topological ideas can be helpful? Okay, so I, I'll just start now. All right, so, um, well, uh, just to give some background, um, throughout history, uh, geometry actually we're all very familiar with. Geometry has provided us uh, ways, provided us language to model uh, the shape, the universe as we see it. Okay, um, things like a classical Euclid's element, uh, Pythagorean theorem, and so on. Now, about a hundred years ago, there's a new kind of geometry called topology that has received a significant uh, uh, study. Well, topology, instead of focusing on the detailed uh, shape and geometrical information, um, topology, like um, you probably hear that the topology, the joke that topologists are those who cannot distinguish a coffee mug from a donut, because even though these two, they don't have the same shape, the same geometry, but they share something in common, okay? And this common structure, both of them have a whole in this case, and this common structure can be described by topological language. In other words, the topology provides us a way to also to model the structure that we may not easily see, okay, the structure behind the data, okay. And in fact, the method is much more powerful, not just the, it's not just to help us to differentiate a donut from a coffee mug, by using topological ideas on functions and maps, you can think there's a properties associated with data, topological method can be used to analyze very complex data, okay. So let me just say that, um, since this, uh, uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime to ask questions. I do not see the chat window easily. You can just uh, raise your, you, know, you can just uh, speak if you have a question and stop me. Okay. All right. So now, why is this relevant? Well, um, um, we all know that now we're in this uh, data era and we have uh, come across with diverse and very complex data routinely. But the data, despite they can be complex, they're not. In, often they're not uh, generated randomly, okay? So data has structure and the shape behind them. So a common example would be, the, the simplest example would be the cluster structure that we often use when we analyze data. Okay, very often the first step we do is that, um, especially in, uh, in biomedical uh, domains that we first project the high dimensional data to low dimensions and hopefully to still see the cluster structure, okay? But there can be also more complex structure behind data. And to this end, uh, using this geometric and topological language help us to both to model and to infer and recover the hidden structure behind complex data. Okay, and this is what TGDA, topological data analysis is about. But to do so, um, we have to combine this geometric and topological ideas with computational considerations, with algorithm development, with statistical analysis. We have to put all of this together, together with different application domains in order to develop meaningful methodologies to analyze complex data. So um, as I said at the beginning, what I want to do in this talk is that I want to use some of our recent work on analyzing graph data as an example to show how these different pieces come, come together, how you know, a very potentially very mathematical 
uh, concepts from uh, uh, in geometry topology can be combined with uh, algorithms with data and then uh, lead to uh, ways how to analyze um, uh, real data from applications. Okay, so. Um, the most of the talk I'm going to focus on the first topic, which is to infer a hidden geometric graph from data. Okay, we're going to see that we're going to talk about different type of data shortly. And then at the end, I will also uh, say a few words about uh, using uh, topological ideas to, uh, to do graph classification, okay, combined with machine learning approaches. All right. So uh, let's start with the problem, which is to uh, infer a hidden one-dimensional nonlinear structure behind data. One can argue this is just a fancy way to say a graph structure, a graph skeleton behind data. Okay, we can argue that um, a graph skeleton, this um, uh, is both nonlinear, locally it's one-dimensional, but it can also have singularity. That's where the junction nodes are. So this kind of graph structure is probably one of the simplest. Um, uh, complex structure, okay, behind data. Um, so for example, let's say we're given a collection of GPS, GPS traces, okay? And this GPS trajectories, say sampled by your cell phone, you just record the trajectories, okay? Now this uh, collection of trajectories, they are sampling a hidden graph structure, which is a road network behind, okay? And the question is that, well, only given this GPS traces, can we recover the road network automatically? Okay, so let's start with the simple problem. Uh, so here, actually, what I'm showing here, this uh, trajectory collected in Berlin. All right, so if we want to solve this automatic road network reconstruction problem, okay, so the problem has been uh, attracted a lot of attention. Um, well, there's, uh, there's some challenges. One of the challenges, trajectory can be noisy, okay? But the bigger challenge is that um, the sampling of the hidden road network, this hidden graph underlined, the sampling is highly non-uniform. So if you are in a residential area, you probably receive many fewer trajectories than in downtown area. Or even in geometrically close location, you could have say um, a very uh, a big highway intersecting a small road. So along the highway, you may receive many more trajectories than the small road. Okay, so this makes the sampling highly non-uniform. Okay. And this kind of um, non-uniform sampling cause trouble because a lot of the prior approaches, they tend to use local information to help us to make decisions, to decide, am I really on a road or am I close to a junction node? And if I'm close to a junction node, if there are different junction nodes, what's the connection between them? Okay, so such decisions are often made by using local neighborhood. Okay, and or, um, also, Typically, some sort of threshold is involved in order to eliminate uh, noise, which is also challenging when we have non-uniform sampling. So what I'm going to show is that the, um, by using um, a topological structure coming from uh, the Morse theory, well, I'm, I'm going to give you the intuition in a minute. Okay? But the key point is that this topological structure is a global structure. So by using this global information, we can now make better decisions. We can now recover this hidden graph, in this case, the road network, um, more robust. And uh, we can be um, less sensitive to small gaps in your data, and in particular, the non-uniform sampling of your input, okay? And you will also see later that then by incorporating uh, algorithms developed into that, the final algorithm is conceptually very clean, also very easy to implement, okay? All right. Um, so uh, what's the idea? Well, uh, instead of looking at the trajectory, let's first convert our input into something more friendly. Let's say that I convert our input into a density field, okay? A scalar function in this case, defined on R2, okay? And where every point has a function value and assume that higher function value indicates more important signal, okay? Um, so in the case of trajectory, we just, uh, we simply resampled those trajectories and did a kernel density estimation. Okay. Now, we have this two-dimensional function, the scalar function defined um, in the plane. If you look at the graph of this function, namely you lift the function value to the Z direction, to the height value. Okay. So what you get is what you see on the right. You've got a terrain intuitively, okay? So you have this mountain ranges. So if you think about it intuitively, the hidden road 
the mountain ridges of this mountain range of this terrain can be used to capture the ro hidden roads because locally, um, the that signal value is kind of higher than when you go off the road than uh, points around it. Okay, and how do we capture this mountain ridges in this density field? Well, we can use uh, something called the one unstable manifold of this density function coming from the Morse theory. You don't have to read any of this on the on the slide. Let me just explain what is it. Okay, so let's look at this picture again. What I'm showing here is the graph of a function defined on R2. Okay, so this terrain is in R3. Now, given the Suppose we have the smooth case, we have the smooth function. Take any point on your terrain, okay? And um, the so-called gradient of this function is simply that the steep is the descending direction of the function at this point. In other words, if you put a drop of water at X, water would flow down following the steep as a descending direction, okay? And that direction is our gradient direction of this function, okay? All right. And if you put a drop of water here at X, the water would continue to flow and always following the gradient direction. And in the end, where would it stop? Well, it will stop when it's at a point where it has nowhere to go. In other words, it stops at a place where the gradient vanishes. There's no more, that locally the, the derivative of vanish becomes zero, okay? And those points where the gradient vanishes are the critical points. Okay, now we imagine that I'm going to, the water can also climb uphill, then uh, it will also stop at uh, this uh, local maximum. Okay, so for a two dimensional function, the critical points are just the minimum, maximum, and also this kind of so called saddle points. Okay, in high dimensions, there are more types of saddle points. Now, in general, if you put a drop of water, the water would flow into the basin, okay, this minimum here. But sometimes, the water will actually flow into saddle points, like what I'm showing here, going from mountain peak to the saddle and here from this mountain peak also to the saddle, okay? And this kind of flow line are necessary because um, roughly speaking, if you put the water on this side of the flow line, it would flow into V1, but if you put on the other side, it's going to go to V2, okay? Somewhere in the middle, it has to have a transition going, separating the different valleys okay, different basins, okay? And that transition is this kind of a flow line, stop at saddles. And intuitively, this is also what we're going to use to capture the mountain ridges, because this is kind of the ridges in your mountain, because if you go around it, you, set, you go into different valleys, okay? So the, what we're saying is that we're going to use this kind of flow line the uh, uh, formal name is the so-called one unstable manifold. So this is basically the flow line going from maximum to saddles to maximum to saddles and then circle around the different basins and separate the different basins, okay? And intu intuitively, this kind of flow lines give us the mountain ridges. So we want to use this to capture the mountain ridges, okay? So that's the idea, okay? So we're going to use one unstable manifold of this function to capture the mountain ridges, which will give us the hidden road. Okay, now this is a uh, computer on the real data. Well, but what's the issue here? Well, the issue is that I, I uh, introduced the concept in the smooth case, but that's not what we have in practice. In practice, we often um, just have some discrete approximation of your domain. We don't have the, say, we have a triangulation of the domain of interest. Okay, namely every element is triangle. Um, and the function value is only at the vertices of this triangulation. Okay. And one can try to approximate all this concept that I introduced in this piecewise linear, in this discrete setting. Okay. The problem is that gradient and all of this one unstable manifold, they are all differential objects. You have to take derivatives. Okay. So they're sensitive to numerical errors and so on. Okay. And also in general, if you have noise, it's hard to do simplification of the structures. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to introduce another concept here, okay, very briefly. This is something called a discrete MOS theory. Okay. This is not a discretization of the MOS theory in the um, uh, discrete setting. It's actually a purely combinatorial version. You're going to see in a minute what I mean by that. 
and was originally proposed by Foreman. And Foreman also proved many beautiful results analogous to the smooth setting. But to, for us, um, one of the key is that the whole concept is combinatorial, so algorithmically it's very easy to handle and it's numerically stable. And also it equipped, it's come together with a tool to help us to later to simplify the, the, the hidden, the, the mountain ridges that we aim to compute. Okay. All right. So let me just quickly go over this just to show what do I mean by this as a combinatorial. Okay. So in the smooth case, a gradient is a vector flows in the a specific vector, vector in the plane or in Rd. Now in the discrete case, my domain is this triangulation. So it's consists of vertices, edges, triangles, tetrahedrons, or their higher dimensional uh, counterparts. Okay, so here then this example is only 2D, so we only have up to triangles. Okay. So a discrete vector is actually a pair of the so-called synthesis, namely edges and the triangle. So this edge, for example, is paired with this triangle. This vertex is paired with this edge. So this I indicated by the arrows here. So it's a pair of simplices. So it's not really a, ve a vector anymore, but this discrete vector still gives us the intuition of the flow direction. So for example, if I start here on this edge, I can flow into this triangle following this pairing. Then I can go out from any of this uh, incident edge, let's say this edge of the triangle, and I continue, uh, continue uh, following the flow, uh, following the discrete vector and flow into this triangle and so on. So this pairing still give me a way to move between simple, this um, simplices, edges, triangles, and so on, and then follow out a pass, a flow pass, okay? And um, if we have a collection of such pairing, such uh, discrete vectors, they form an analogous uh, uh, valid uh, uh, discrete gradient vector field um, if each simplex, simplex means vertices, edges, and triangles, if each simplex only appear in at the most one such pair, because at any moment, you can only have one gradient vector. And also, if there's no cyclic pass, because if you follow the gradient pass, you're supposed to keep flowing down, you shouldn't come back, so there shouldn't be any cycle. Okay, so in other words, if I have some condition on this such uh, discrete um, vectors, then I get a valid discrete gradient vector field. You can, that's kind of uh, um, analogous to the smooth uh, flow line that we talked about, uh, the smooth gradient vector field we mentioned earlier. Okay. And the simplex is critical if it does not appear in any pairing. Okay, that basically means at this point, I don't have any vector associated with me, so my gradient vanishes. All right, um, so what I said here is that um, we kind of understand the intuition in the smooth setting. In the discrete setting, roughly speaking, you can think that now um, every a, a, a critical simplex now kind of corresponds to the previously the critical points, okay? And um, the, uh, in fact, uh, the, the, in general, the uh, so-called d-dimensional simplex in d-dimensions corresponds to a critical points of index K, okay? So in 2D, what this means is that um, critical vertices corresponds to minimum, critical triangles corresponds to maximum, the terrain we saw earlier, the maximum, and the critical edges corresponds to the saddle points, okay? And we wanted to capture the mountain ridges. So we're looking for this kind of flow path going from critical max, uh, uh, triangles, namely maximum, to saddles, so this is a blue pass. Okay, so this corresponds to the one unstable manifold earlier. Now, um, in high dimension, even our domain is not two dimensions, it's high dimensions. Unfortunately, this one unstable manifold, I have to look at high dimensional simplices. I have to look at the simplices of dimension D and their paths going to simplices of dimension D minus one, which is expensive to compute, okay? So I'm going to just do a little trick instead of the density function, let's look at the minus of the density function, the negation of that. So now maximum become minimum, okay? So instead of mountain ridges, now you try to capture the valley ridges, okay? The, um, why do I do that? Because in the discrete setting, in smooth setting, there's no difference, but in the discrete setting, those paths that I need to find corresponding to this valley ridges now corresponds to uh, this flow line between critical edges and the critical vertices, okay? So uh, it doesn't matter 
what's the dimension of your domain to compute this kind of um, uh, value ridges. I only need, um, in the end, I only need uh, um, vertices, edges, and the triangle. Okay, I don't need a high dimensional simplicity. So that's why we do this. Uh, okay, all right. So there's one more thing I mentioned why we want to go with this uh, discrete more theory, which is that it also give us a way to simplify uh, the, the, the discrete vector field. So if you have two critical simplices, okay, then it turns out that there's a combinatorial way to invert the direction. And so that afterwards, none of these two are critical. So this is kind of the discrete analog of this. In the smooth case, I could, if I want to, reduce the number of critical points in my function. So reduce those local, uh, local up and downs, okay? Then you can cancel pairs of critical points and then smooth it out, okay? So in the discrete case, you have a way to do that and it's a very easy way to, to do that, okay? All right, so we're almost there uh, to show the algorithm. Um, now, um, what I said is that um, uh, we have this discrete language to model this mountain ridges, or in this case, the valley ridges. And I also said that um, we have this cancellation operation that can help us to cancel out critical points, namely reduce the number of critical points. And when you remove unnecessary uh, critical points, like min and max, you also simplify the resulting one stable manifolds as well, okay? Um, but the question is that, um, which pairs of critical points should I simplify? How do I know what is the important the mountain peak? What is the less important the mountain peak? Okay, which should I cancel out? Okay, and, in, and naturally, this process to decide which critical uh, points that we want to cancel out should respect the density function that we're given, right? So you've uh, given the, the input density function. There are certain critical points you want to consider them to be less important and then to, to be noise and want to smooth them out. Okay, so we should use the density function to help us to decide which critical pairs that we're going to cancel out. Okay. And how do, you do I, how do I do that in the principled manner? Well, for this, I have to bring in yet another um, uh, uh, concept, uh, notion, it's called a persistent homology. This is actually, the persistent homology is actually one of the most important development in the field of uh, uh, topological data analysis, okay? So, um, I will not give you its full version, but let me give you the simple example to, to show you what it's about, okay? To give you the intuition, what is this? So let's say we're given this function, okay? In this function, we see if I stay far back, then I see there really just two prominent minimum and the two, three prominent mountain peaks, this one, this one, and this one, okay? But if you look at the number of critical points, I have many more critical points. I have this, here's the minimum, here's the maxima, here's minima, maxima, minima, maxima, and so on, okay? But really intuitively, we look at this picture, we see that there are only three prominent um, uh, up and downs, okay? The others are noise. And hopefully I want to have a way to be able to capture that, okay? So what do I do? Now imagine that you are going to, I'm going to have a line here, and I'm going to sweep this function bottom up, okay? And when I do that, I keep track of, in this simple case, since we only have a one-dimensional case, let me just, in general, I keep track of the so-called topological feature, okay? But in, the, in this simple case, one-dimensional case, I just keep track of the so-called zero-dimensional homological feature, which is just connect components, okay? So now I'm going to sweep this bottom up and then keep track of the connect components information, okay? So now, when I come, when I meet this minimum x1, what happens? Well, after I pass x1, I create a new component in the portion I swept through. This portion is called sublevel set, okay? So now I have a new component, this orange one in the sublevel set, okay? So I say that, okay, x1 is a creator because it created some topological feature. In this case, it's just new component. And I do the same at X2, another component was created. X3, yet another one was created. Then something happens at X4. At X4, I merge two components, the one created at X3 and the one created at X2. This two got merged together into a single one, okay? So X4, we say that it's a destroyer. 
it kills some topological feature. Okay. Not only that, I also want to know that which feature did X4 destroy? Okay. It turned out that there's a way to pair X4 up with the feature created X at X3. Intuitively, what does that mean? Intuitively, the component created at X3, okay, got merged into this bigger component that was created earlier at X2, okay? That's why we say X4 killed the one created at, at X3, okay? So these two got paired up. And after this, the, the component that I created at X2 still survives, okay? So it's still there, okay? But the one that created at X3 disappeared. So it's paired with X4. Okay, so this process not only just to give us a, whether they're creator or a destroyer, it also pair up the features. Okay, so I continue to do this till now. The later the feature created at, at x two will be uh, killed at time x five, then um, this what I show here. This are all the pairing of the feature. Okay, so what is what is the outcome of this process? Well, the outcome is that you give me this function. Now I pair up all the critical points. So I got a bunch of pairs. Okay, this is called a persistent pairing. And each pair, say x2 and x5, it indicates the creation and the death of some topological features through this course. Okay. And the function value, the height between these two points, the function value difference between them gives me how long did that feature survive. Okay, so for example, the feature x3, x4, the persistence, namely the height difference is very small. The function value difference is very small. So it didn't survive long. So it has low persistence. While the feature x2, x5 has a much bigger persistence. Okay, so it's a, it's a, a more important feature. Okay, and you can also plot the birth and the death time of these features in this diagram. This is so-called a persistent diagram. So the persistent diagram records that for your input function, when, the, when do pe features create and when do they die and um, their birth and death are recorded in this, um, this diagram where the x-axis is the birth time of a feature and the y-axis is death time, okay? Now in this example, I'm using a very simple case and also the function is a height function, but in general, this can be a very complex function defined on complex domains, okay? I hope you get the intuition that we see here that the output of this persistence algorithm is that it kind of pair up the features, the critical points based on the importance of the features it generate. And as you can see in the end, we would have this maximum X5 and also this one, I did the market here. This are the maximum which would have large persistence or the other maximum and minimum has a low persistence, so they can be considered as noise. So this helps us to figure out what are the true signal, what are the noise, okay? So the function value itself is not a good um, uh, criteria. For example, this point has similar function value as this peak, but this is a not important mountain peak. Here, really, you just have one major mountain peak, okay? All right, so now in the discrete case, uh, when we have uh, just a triangulation of the domain, you can simulate what I just said earlier by the so-called lower star filtration. What this does is that it's going to pair up all the simplices now, vertices, edges, edges, triangles, and so on. But the meaning remains the same. Each pair indicates the creation and death of some topological feature and their function value difference give me the importance of them. So this gives me a way to measure importance of all this uh, uh, critical simplices. Okay. And with this in mind, now here is the uh, a first algorithm that I can use to recover a hidden graph skeleton from our uh, data. Okay. So right now the setup is a little bit, uh, it's, it's, it's um, uh, um, suppose we're given the triangulation of a domain, okay, can be any domain RD. And we have a function available at the vertices of this triangulation. And I'm going to have a threshold delta to do simplification. But this is not just the thresholding the lower function value, it's going to be threshold the lower persistent values, okay? So what do I do? I start by computing the persistence, run this algorithm to figure out who are important, who are not important, okay? And at the beginning, I let everyone to be critical, okay? So all the simplest are critical. 
Then using this persistent information, I basically, for all those pairs whose persistence at most the delta, I consider them to be noise. So I try to perform this Morse cancellation to cancel them out, okay? And then after this is step two, I simply use this persistent to guide me to decide who I should eliminate, okay? And then in step three, after I finish this, I can then um, uh, look at all the remainder critical edges. This corresponds to saddles, okay? Uh, we look at critical edges with persistence bigger than delta. Namely, we only look at important saddle points, okay, not those noisy points. And then from them, there, I trace out this one stable manifold, essentially this valley ridges to give us the reconstruction, okay? So that's it, okay? So um, it doesn't matter what's the domain, the dimension of the domain, but we only need the so-called two skeleton of this triangulation, namely, uh, vertices, edges, and triangles, because we're only aiming to recover the one stable manifold behind, okay? So here are some examples. Um, the blue are the trajectories that we have, and the black are the uh, road network automatically reconstructed using the algorithm I just described, okay? Um, uh, in the Berlin and the ASINS case, you see the light color uh, graph in the background, that is the uh, ground truth, that's the true road network, while the uh, dark colored one are our reconstruction, okay? Um, this is just to show the effect of the persistent based simplification. So this is not a thresholding of your input signal. This is a, a threshold of those less important critical points, more like a relative uh, importance, okay? So with a small persistence, you reconstruct a lot of details, and as you increase the persistence, you get mostly the major parts uh, the remains, okay? And this is just to say that the thresholding wouldn't work. Okay, so let me actually uh, not dwell here. I just want to point out that the advantage of this, as I said at the beginning, is that this mountain ridges, this is actually a global structure, okay? So compared to previous approaches, so this is a well prior uh, state of the art, you can see that they get locally, they may get the uh, street well, but then the street can be segmented, okay? Well, now, since we're using the global mountain ridges, so even if you have some missing data, but if you have two mountain peaks around it, you may still go through it by using the most likely pass. So that's why you can uh, get um, uh, is the, the output is less segmented. You are using the global information to help you to go through those weak signals. Um, this can be used that we have uh, applied this to um, reconstruct uh, neurons, uh, both from uh, very high resolution images or also from very coarse resolution uh, whole brain images. Uh, in the second case, the what I'm showing in the bottom, and instead of being reconstructing individual neurons, here we're reconstructing the neuron bundles uh, in, in the brain, okay? Um, so let me just point out that um, this approach, actually, we can also provide uh, theoretical guarantees. And interestingly, while we try to understand why this works and what can we out, uh, show that in what case we can guarantee it works, while we're trying to ponder this question, it actually also gives us a much simpler algorithm. Okay, I, let me just mention this algorithm because this, um, uh, uh, so th this is the original algorithm. We have three steps, conceptually it's very clean. The first step, I have to do a persistent computation to figure out who are important, who are not important. Okay, so this step I have to do, I take this as a black box. And uh, uh, because persistent homology has been one of the major development in topological data analysis, there are many algorithm software developed to compute persistent homology efficiently. Okay, so we take this step as a black box there. Okay, then previously in step two, I have to look at all those uh, pairs that can uh, that who's with low persistence and then try to cancel them out. And I forgot to tell you earlier that I may not be able to cancel out all of them. This is because that after cancellation, you invert a certain path combinatorially. You have to check whether you form any cycle in the resulting discrete gradient vector field or not. Because in a true gradient vector field, it can only go down, the flow can only go down. You shouldn't have any cycle, okay? So um, not all cancellation is allowed. So uh, in step two, before we have to do this cancellation one by one, and also for each of them, we have to check, is it even valid, okay? And then in step three, we collect the final output for the remainder important saddles. We find out their um, 
one stable manifold, namely their mountain ridges. Okay, it turned out that the step two, it turned out that I don't even have to do any cancellation. I don't have to maintain any discrete gradient vector field at all, even though my intuition coming from this. Okay, it turned out um, uh, uh, we can actually just uh, go through all the edges and pick some specific edges. Okay, those uh, edges uh, uh, with information coming from the persistent algorithm. And those edges give me a spanning forest, okay? And this spanning forest is sufficient for me to later recover the mountain ridges, okay? In particular, in the third step to recover the mountain ridges, I just need to do certain tree traversal to find a certain tree paths, okay? So the whole thing now, step two and step three, okay, becomes super simple. Once you do the persistent computation, which is a black box, now step two and three is a linear time algorithm because you only need to go through all the edges, pick certain edges out to form a spanning forest, and then you need to do some tree traversal, that's it. Okay, so the algorithm become linear time other than the time to compute persistence, which I didn't give you the time here. This one can be costly dependent on your domain. Okay, and this actually holds for any dimensions. And the final algorithm as such is also extremely easy to implement. We have the algorithm in GitHub, but um, you can implement your own version because it's rather, it's quite, uh, other than the persistent computation, which you can take off the shelf uh, implementation, the remainder is uh, very easy to implement, okay? And we also have some theoretical bound on, and in what case can we reconstruct this graph correctly, both in terms of geometry, namely it's close to the true graph, hidden graph, and the topology as well. Okay, and but you may say that well, the setup you are talking about um, is very limited. You have to have a triangulation of your domain, and um, which would not really scale to very high dimensional data. And indeed, that's the case. Okay, and turn out that if we're now given just point clouds, we that's very often we just have some point. Um, our input is a collection of points or vectors in some very high dimensional space. Okay, and now we're given such point clouds data in high dimensional space. Uh, how do I recover the graph skeleton of that? Okay, and I actually want to motivate this using another application uh, from neuroscience that we're looking at, which is that um, what we have here is a, collect, a, a single cell RNA six data set with roughly 20,000 cells expressing 97 genes. So you can think that this is roughly 20,000 points in 97 dimensional space, okay? And we want to understand what is the space behind the cells, okay? This, uh, using this um, uh, uh, gene expression data, okay? Um, again, I mean, uh, RNA data, I mean, there are a lot of studies about it and, um, and also, um, uh, very often, if you look at analysis, very often um, they focus on when they, especially when they project this high dimensional data to low dimensional space, very often they focus on cluster analysis. Then, you know, then they say, oh, this is a certain cell types and so on, okay? Um, but um, the cells in some sense, especially when they're in the developmental stage, they actually evolve in some sense continuously. In other words, you can imagine that this high dimensional cells, okay? There's a continuous structure behind that, okay? And how do I get some information about that continuous space behind all the cells, okay? You can imagine there's a, some high dimensional manifold where all the cells live in, okay? And of course, on a high level, there may be some cluster structures that uh, tell you the cell types, but there's also a gradient between them. There's, uh, you know, evol um, the, the, the evolving trajectories, uh, in the cells, okay? We want to capture this continuous structure, okay? So uh, this can be um, using our, um, uh, this from this graph point of view, now I can think that I'm giving this high dimensional rna sick data and I want to compute the uh, graph skeleton behind it, okay? So I may not be able to reconstruct the higher dimensional structure, but let's focus on the graph skeleton, okay? So given the set of points, uh, which hope, presumably sample from some hidden graph, we want to recover this, infer this graph from this noisy points, okay? Um, let me just point out that the algorithm that I uh, described earlier uh, doesn't work 
uh, in this point cloud setting due to many factors, okay? Including that you don't want to triangulate your ambient space where the data is because that space is super uh, uh, high dimensional. So it's very expensive to triangulate. Okay, um, there uh, work in the literature where you don't have to triangulate the entire space. Maybe you just build some structure around the points. Okay, that also have certain issues. Okay, especially that approach doesn't handle noise, um, the ambient noise very well. So what I'm showing here is that um, um, uh, this is actually a projection of um, uh, data sets from image patches, three by three image patches. So the image patches uh, lives in, since it's three by three, actually live in nine dimensional space, okay? Actually, it had been studied before, it had the so-called three circle model behind, okay? But uh, when you look at all the points, it's so noisy that you don't really see that three circle model, okay? Um, um, so here, essentially what we did is that um, by combining different ideas, including that using something called distance to measure to handle this issue of noise, and also using specification to handle the issue that um, uh, if you build some um, triangulation kind of uh, um, uh, complex to model your space, it can be very cute in size. We have a specification strategy. When you put everything together, uh, we essentially have a, a, an, a, an algorithm that works for point clouds data, okay? They're based on the uh, similar ideas. And this is just to show the reconstruction of reconstructed from this point set. Okay, you can ignore the middle picture. Um, this is the blue here, the blue circle is actually the uh, reconstruction by our algorithm, which almost match perfectly with the three circle model of this data set. Okay, even though that the, you know, by visualization, you don't see that structure anymore. Okay. And this is when we apply this to the uh, single cell RNA seq data. So um, this is still ongoing work with uh, my collaborator Pasan Mitra uh, from Cold Spring Harbor and uh, Mike H from Allen's Institute uh, for Brain Science. So uh, um, uh, the one interesting thing is that even though we were not sure at the beginning what's the dimension of the hidden space behind this RNA seq data, okay? But after we compute this graph skeleton, it seems that this data uh, the underlying space have indeed a one-dimensional uh, nonlinear structure because what we get is that we often have this very clear, almost a tree-like shape. Okay, there are very few loops, which you don't expect in general when you, um, if your dimension is, uh, um, uh, if you have a surface and you try to uh, scale, uh, get a graph skeleton of it, you may get a lot of a little um, uh, like uh, like a grid. Okay, you would have a lot of loops, but here you almost have no loops. So it's almost like a tree-like structure, which is kind of interesting. We're still studying this to see whether this pathway indicated in this reconstruction uh, give us any insights about maybe the relation between the cells and so on beyond the cluster analysis. Okay. So let me now just point out a couple of ways where we um, use this. Uh, so what I said just now, uh, doesn't have much machine learning inside. It's really, it's an algorithm combined with a, a mathematical um, uh, uh, structure and um, uh, to give us a way to infer graph skeleton, okay? So um, so here you can use this idea also combined with uh, CNN to uh, reconstruct the road network automatically from a satellite image, okay? Um, uh, this one is a bit more interesting, which um, um, here, um, the idea is the following. Um, you try, uh, you're given all these brain images, which can be very noisy. And we want to segment the, the neuron cell processes from these images, okay? And of course, that way nowadays with the advancement of AI, especially in their ability in handling images, we have a ma many very powerful architecture, especially for image analysis for segmentation, okay? So for example, uh, UNET is very effective in doing image segmentation. Okay, on the other hand, okay, now just look at this picture. Um, the, the very often um, your segmentation, the, what you segment out, what you consider to be signal depends on your loss function, okay? You give a different bias, depends on what loss function you use. And th those loss functions are often uh, pixel based, okay? So if I have, for example, here, really visually, we can imagine that my neuron cell here branches into this Y shaped, okay? But if I just miss a, a few uh, pixels and I break this branches, you know, uh, make them broken, 
then from my loss function point of view, in general, that's not a, no big deal. Okay, I still have a low loss. Okay, so in other words, the a lot of this architecture, uh, popular architecture, CNN included, they often are not aware of the global structure or explicit structure behind the data. Okay, so here what we did is that um, in order to fix this, uh, we basically take this discrete loss uh, reconstruction, destruction as another input together, co-train together with the UNET architecture to let them complement each other, okay? Now, why don't I use discrete MOS direct? So this is segmentation without using the topological prior, okay? Um, oops, I didn't show it. So why don't I use discrete MOS directly? Well, it turned out that discrete MOS approaches, even though it can simplify noises, but for this kind of very challenging images, discrete MOS is give me a lot of, even though it can connect this Y shapes, but also give me a lot of false positives, okay? So UNET, it's very good at figure out what is signal, what is not signal, what is background, okay? But it can miss, it, it's, it's oblivious about the global structure. So it may not give me a nice structure, while discrete MOS um, can have a lot of false positive, okay? So that's why we put them together, let them to complement each other, okay? So in the end, we get a better um, uh, final segmentation, okay? Let the two to uh, address each other's mission. Oops, I thought I have a slide on results. I guess I didn't include it. Um, so here, that's we use the topological structure as a prior, but you can also directly put the topological structure as the term for the uh, loss term in the loss function. Okay, so here is also in different kind of uh, neuron images a segmentation where we add a term uh, which is to force that its topological structure looks similar to the ground truth topological structure okay so if things should be connected here they they will be connected okay a challenge here when you try to do this is that you can have any loss function you want but your loss function has to be differentiable okay and this before was a challenge because it was not clear topological quantity how do you make it into differentiable but then turn out that with the help of persistent homology one can uh, uh, tackle this challenge okay so this is um uh and put a topological constraint into the loss function instead of prior, okay? Let me just point out another thing that also earlier before uh, the talk started, we're talking about um, um, not everyone in the domain necessarily uh, know a lot of this um, uh, uh, architectures or tools that the AI community had, had produced, okay? Another thing I want to say is that also very often depends on the data, Okay, we, we do have powerful architecture um, uh, um, uh, existing, but what is the right architecture to use? And it depends on your input data. And um, it's also a question, okay? You have to understand the pros and the cons of, of your architecture in order to choose the right, um, uh, build the right model for your input data, okay? So here I want to use an application we did in mature science um, as an example. Uh, where um, we have the um, 3D images, micro CT images of rocks, and we want to predict the so-called uh, permeability, which is kind of related to how liquids uh, um, flow inside the rocks, okay? Now, um, there have been a range of work where people in the field, in the material science, they have been using uh, AI um, um, pipelines. They use the CNNs to predict this permeability directly from the 3D images. Okay, but if you think about it, really what matters for the permeability is actually, so you, ha you have the rocks, inside you have these grains, okay, the little particles. And really how the, what decides the permeability is how the liquid flows through the empty space between the grains, okay, the so-called pore network. Okay, so um, that make more sense instead of using a, a CNN, which doesn't really, is not aware of the structure, it makes more sense to get the support network and then use a GN, graph neural network based architecture to do this prediction. And that's what we did. We used the graph algorithm I just described to first uh, reconstruct the poor network. And then we use um, echovariant GNN to predict the permeability. Okay. All right, so this is what I, uh, um, I don't know whether I still have a few minutes or not. Uh, if I do, maybe let me just uh, say a few more words about um, uh, application in graph classification using topological ideas. Okay, so the second part. So now, um, well, uh, so here is um, uh, 
a, a pipeline that we often um, uh, use to uh, analyze data. We're given some input, say a collection of point sets or collection of, in this case, I have a collection of a neuron trees. So each of this tree actually uh, it corresponds to a neuron cell, okay? The morphology of a neuron cell. So I have a collection of objects, okay? Um, and this object can be complex, okay? Like the, here is the tree uh, data, we have a collection of trees. Very often, what do we do? We first find some meaningful feature space. We map this collection of input to a collection of points in your feature space, find some uh, uh, feature representation, okay? Then you perform the downstream data analysis tasks uh, in, in that uh, feature space, okay? And the persistent homology that I just mentioned turned out that give us a very generic framework to, to do this feature mapping, map into the feature space, okay? In particular, um, for each of this object, in this case, tree, okay, it turned out that there's a way, as long as you can put some descriptor function on top of that, you can then represent this tree using this persistent diagram that I mentioned earlier. Remember, the persistent diagram kind of it um, record the birth and the death of all important features across all scales of, the, of your input objects into the single diagram, okay? And you can treat this persistent in, uh, diagram as a point in the space of persistent diagrams, okay? So now you do this for each of the tree, now you've got a bunch of points in the space of persistent diagram. That's your feature space, okay? Then you can perform downstream analysis, okay? Now, when you look at this, you may think, hmm, this persistent diagram doesn't look so friendly as a feature representation, okay? And indeed, um, in the past decade, there have been a range of work trying to find the best way to put kernels or directly map a persistent diagram into some uh, finite or infinite dimensional vectors, or you can have kernels for persistent diagrams, okay? And what we did with um, my student, Zhao, is that we're actually also using data to learn the best metric for persistent diagram in a data-driven manner. And then once we have that, we use it for graph classification. So here's the benchmark data sets. Um, the graph can be social graphs or um, molecular graphs, protein um, graphs and so on. And uh, so this was two years old. We compared with all the state-of-the-art uh, approach at the time, which included both kernel-based measures and also graph neural network-based measures. And uh, uh, this is the results of our um, uh, 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 approaches without using uh, neural network in this case, okay? And uh, also it doesn't use any attributes of the uh, input at all, okay? So it's uh, comparable or better than the uh, previous state of the art. Um, now, um, on the other hand, graph neural network, as I just said, is indeed a very powerful architecture that can um, handle a graph type of data. Okay, in fact, you can also use that to handle point type data. Given the point set, okay, you can actually first create, say, a neighborhood graph from that, and then use the graph neural network to handle points data as well. Okay, and um, in the past uh, few years, there have been a, um, a lot of work on. Um, using graph neural network for different applications also to provide a better understanding of graph neural network theoretically, okay? And what's, uh, but it is known that the graph neural network, at least the vanilla versions of it, has limited, limited capacity in capturing global structure in your graph, okay? So if you start with um, uh, just a standard node features, um, random, uh, features or degree and so on, graph neural network cannot learn, for example, what is the smallest cycle in this graph, okay? So you cannot capture this kind of global or topological features, okay? And how do I address this to make the graph neural network more informative, more powerful? So here, what we can do is that the persistent homology that I just went, mentioned actually is very powerful at capturing such features or the topological feature. Okay, so what you can do is that at every node, you can compute its, I think, um, at every node in the graph, you can compute the persistent summary of its neighborhood. And I use this both as node feature and also use this for edge attention, okay? And this increased the, uh, the, the um, power of uh, graph neural networks in uh, uh, different tasks. Okay, in particular, we have recently, uh, uh, try to use this persistent based enhanced the graph neural network for uh, material uh, mechanical sorry mechanical property prediction 
uh, for carbon nanotube um, uh, composites. Okay, we predict the mechanical property directly from the initial atomic structure. Okay, so here you don't just want to treat the input as a graph, you want to encode both local geometry and topological information to help to tell you maybe that uh, so topological information is used to summarizing for every atom, how, what is the distribution of other atoms around it. Okay, so. All right, so um, I hope that uh, what I said here give you some examples of how we use uh, ideas, topological ideas and topological uh, algorithm to help us um, uh, um, uh, analyze um, hidden structure behind data or we can also use this to complement existing machine learning pipelines to make them, for example, more structure aware, okay? Um, I just want to conclude by saying that, as I said at the beginning, humankind has always interacted with the world through data, okay? The data issue is not a new issue, okay? And then through the course, we have always used the mathematics, uh, including geometry plus computation um, to help us since ancient time although the computation before is always hand computation, okay? For example, we have been um, trying to track the, uh, the, the movement of celestial bodies and so on, okay? And um, of course, that what, what's new now is that um, we have unprecedented availability of complex data. So the data is not just in bigger volume, but they are also much more complex than before. The, their format is far more complex. What could matter What's behind them can also, the structure behind them is also more complex, okay? We also have unprecedented the computational power, okay? So this also um, required that we have to rethink how, um, how to use classical uh, mathematical models and the mathematical objects combined with algorithms and the computational method to help us to systematically interpret data, okay? And um, uh, I hope that I, at least the, uh, show you that how a TGDA, topological and geometric data analysis, which is uh, uh, what I'm interested in, uh, offers one perspective uh, to help us to achieve that by focusing on structure and shape of data. Okay, and uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, so we are scheduled until the top of the hour. So um, we have 15 minutes that if we want, we can do uh, questions and discussion. Uh, my mind is racing in many different directions, just thinking about how uh, different approaches that I know um, might be missing out on some of the more global structure because our algorithms are very local sensitive, you know, um, but I always try to be very good and not dominate the conversation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor first for other people to ask questions. And if there's a lull, then I'm going to sneak in some of my questions. Sure. So uh, anybody feel free to unmute. And if you do not have a working microphone, if you put it in the chat, I, I will monitor uh, and, and help ask those questions as well. Not exactly a question, but you know, when I was studying simplexes, I always was sure that such abstract idea cannot be used in any way, you know, in real life. <laughs> Absolutely no, no way. Yeah. Oh, well. well, I mean, they're, they're, they're nice building blocks too. Because I mean, especially very often our data, the input is point clouds, right? And when you're just given point samples, they don't really have a uh, structure themselves. They don't, they, there's no concept of space, right? So the simplest simple, simplicial complex really pr provide us the building blocks to help us to model, to connect the points, to at least give us an approximation of the space um, behind them. So, yeah. Sure. Do you have any packages? So um, uh, the graph reconstruction, uh, as I mentioned, that is available on GitHub. I don't know whether it's on my website or not. Most likely, yes. Um, I think I transitioned in my websites. Uh, um, and uh, a lot of topological uh, uh, data analysis tools. So there are a few really nice, um, there's something called the Goody I'm putting in the chat window, okay? And there's another one, uh, what is the name? So uh, they're really nice in the sense that not only they provide a lot of this algorithm to compute, for example, persistent homology, 
and so on. They actually also have packaged or already connected them to machine learning pipelines. Mm. Okay, so for example, as I said just now that um, maybe how to make uh, some of the machine learning pipeline uh, structure aware, you may want to add topological loss to your neural networks, right? So you may want, and you may want to add it at the end or in the middle somewhere else. Then, so you, you, you want to be able to, uh, do, um, to add this topological layer, okay? So uh, there are tools that um, I, um, I don't know how uh, easy to use they are, but there are um, open source code already that allow you to, um, to, to facilitate you adding a topological layer into your architecture. So we have a question in the chat, yeah? Um, what is Go the ahead. challenge to apply container jumps in topology for neuroscience? Um, well, I mean, I worked with uh, 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 my collaborator, uh, Pastor Mitchell, uh, for more than a few years now. Um, I just as my personal perspective, I think that uh, um, um, one thing is always what is really the right question to ask that is both scientifically meaningful for neuroscientists but also something that uh, um, uh, we can help, the geometry or topological idea can help with, okay? Um, uh, so figuring out the right question to, to ask, we don't want to just apply this graph reconstruction algorithm to anything, right? I mean, um, the data has to make sense in the case of that, of uh, uh, neuron reconstruction and uh, summarizing neuron bundles, that was a natural fitting that actually motivated our development of all this uh, uh, algorithm as well. Okay. Um, the second that, again, um, I find the challenging that uh, to, because um, the, the data is never, never as clean as I wish they are. <laughs> and then you probably live with this a uh, lot of time. So a lot of time uh, we struggle with that, uh, how, what is the right way to even, uh, you, you cannot just say that uh, here I have a brilliant idea of an algorithm and it should work. No, you have to. Uh, integrate your algorithm with different uh, um, uh, considerations or including preprocessing. Preprocessing is just part of it. Sometimes you also have to add extra addition to your, uh, net, uh, to, your, to your algorithm so that it can handle all the missing data or the noise and different issues that come with the real data. So, yeah. Um, I think uh, recent years there's been, a, um, a, I wouldn't say, a, a, the, using uh, uh, geometric and topological um, ideas for neuroscience and also in maternal science has attracted a lot of attention, partly because um, the data over there, very often they are actually geometry rich. Okay, so they actually, um, uh, and you care about the structure behind. Okay, um, that, that's, um, and um, a, a lot of the development in uh, AI and machine learning um, are also aiming at more standard uh, type of uh, data. What I mean is that, um, so uh, like, like CNN is good for images and uh, um, you have architecture for good for sentences and so on. So when you have the specific um, uh, uh, data, material data or neuroscience data, um, th th this actual complexity are not yet uh, easily handled by the existing uh, AI or machine learning pipelines. And there's, this is where I think uh, a lot of geometric and topological methods can, can help to put them together, yeah. All right. So we have a question about your website. Yes, so, I just typed it. Did I? Okay, awesome. Um, so with the with the graph reconstruction, I, I um, what came to mind for me is this sort of uh, worst case scenario I once had. I was driving up to Los Angeles and there was this busy street and there's another busy street. And it turned out that where my GPS sent me um, was this busy street and I needed to be on this busy street. And what it didn't understand is that there was a train track that went right through there. Um, and it was uh -huh. mere feet separating the two of them. Uh, but of course, I was late for my meeting because I had to drive all the way around uh, to get to the correct location. Would that be kind of a pathological case for the, the graph reconstruction? Or 
Is that something that you think sort of the, you know, when you're sort of doing the noise cancellation that you will see that these really should not be connected components? I mean, so that's a great question. I think uh, right now, um, what I'm showing here is more generic framework, right? And in that case, and there, whatever application, whether it's low network or it's in neuron reconstruction, then the, we, there are also information that we're not leveraging yet. So for example, in the scenario you said, right? I mean, it is challenging if you put, purely put this as um, graph reconstruction setup, because then you don't really know, are these two really should be one single road or are they two separate roads? Are this one way and so on, right? However, imagine that suppose now you also use the uh, flow information. Mm. Right. In most of the trajectories, actually, which we didn't use because we were just trying to demonstrate that you can have this reconstruction even without using anything else. But suppose now you also put a certain vector information with the flow. Right. And that help that help you to resolve the ambiguity. Mm. OK. And you can combine that information. You know, you can uh, then the, the interesting question is that how do you integrate such information into the, the, the current framework? Cool, thank you. Uh, professor, um, you said that you applied the first algorithm to I think genome data and uh, or the RNA data. The RNA, yeah, the expression. And uh, found that it was mostly tree, tree-like data or mm -hmm. the graph you got was a tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you say that the tree approximates the data, do you mean that, so your algorithm outputs a weighted tree Right. Uh, okay, so uh, I didn't talk about the, the, the okay, um, so the, the tree that I show you, it's only the graph skeleton, the skeleton of the data. In other words, it doesn't include all the uh, uh, cells. Oh, okay. Okay, however, you can, uh, all the other cells, what happens is that, so it, again, come back to the terrain uh, metaphor. Um, these are, are the mountain ridges, yeah? All the other cells are on the side of the mountain, okay? And those cells, they flow into the mountain ridges, okay? So if we need, we can also get all the remainder of cell and you actually have that flow information. So for all the other cells, you know, what is the pathway they will follow to flow into this major backbone? Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah. So what? What? But it, we did find it very interesting that uh, what we see is a tree. Okay. In general, I would imagine that I would see at least a graph with many loops. Okay. And very interestingly, we see very few loops. It's almost just like a tree. It's almost like your clustering tree. Okay. But here, of course, this this flow is really coming from the density in some sense. Yeah, that part uh, interested me about the tree because I don't know if you're aware about uh, my work in hyperbolic, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I guess you say data science, but uh, they are very interested in trying to find the tree structure of data mm -hmm. and maybe right. just thinking there's some relation between your right. algorithm. So there are some relation, although the focus is a bit different in the hyperbolic uh, embedding, for example, so what they are aiming is that they want to embed it into a hyperbolic space, which is more naturally, uh, so a hyperbolic metrics more naturally for, uh, for, for, for tree, for hierarchical structure, okay? So um, that you can think that that is more, um, it's not getting a geometric tree, but rather that is more like a getting a hierarchical clustering tree. Like a, oh, okay. you know, like a hierarchical classing tree, how different things gradually merge together. So yeah. Thanks. And and the the, the, the we, what we get here is a tree is really was not expected. It was uh, was not that in general we would get a graph. In the case of neuron reconstruction from three D images, of course we know neurons are tree morphology. So we actually have to do uh, post processing to 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 output the trees because otherwise it's not neuron cells, okay? But in general, when you reconstruct it, it's surprising that we get almost tree-like structure. Okay, I will open it up for, I think, one more question uh, before we uh, let Professor Wang get back to her evening. Anybody want to be the last question? Go 
going once, going twice. Okay, so then uh, we'll wrap things up here. Um, thank sure. you again. Thank you so much for the presentation. No and, problem. And I really, I saw there's a question just saying that the Gatta papers I mentioned. Oh, um, mm -hmm. I, I can send some reference uh, to Ted later, and if it wants to populate. And um, another thing, I just realized that they might bad that um, I think throughout the talk, I forgot to pre give credit to all my collaborators. I mean, this is the John works with so many different people. I have them in the slides. If you ever get the slides, please. Uh, <laughs> this is really um, uh, um, with the many people and especially my students. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, we're really happy to have you in our backyard here in San Diego now. Um, it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, thanks again for joining us. Uh, everyone, thanks for, for um, coming to the presentation. And uh, we hope to see you uh, either next month at the next uh, UCSC talk or at some of our other events. All right, thank I you very much. I have my email there. Any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. <laughs>